And we're back and we are ready to roll. Now we're talking about buses. I mean, this is in South Africa, public transport, massive, massive thing. You know, we, we've woken up this morning to a massive hike in petrol. Um, everyone in the public sector already talking about taxis now having to increase prices. Uh, so much of our workforce use public transport. Um, and I think it's a massive option, Yaku, for, for electrifying a large amount of the population is public transport. Oh, absolutely, Rob. And I, we spoke about I mean, in the transport logistics sector where you've got set routes. Bus is another thing. Transport, uh, public transport, again, has got set routes that they follow. Yeah. Again, it, 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 it's probably the best opportunity for us to, to, to build charge networks for that. Build the buses. Uh, so really excited to see what Gideon's got. Fantastic. And uh, here to talk to us this morning is Gideon Netling from Golden Arrow Bus Services. Gideon, are you with us, sir? Hello, Rob. I'm um, here, yes. Fantastic. Gideon, we are going to, we, we've run a little bit into your time, so I'm going to stop, uh, I'm going to stop prattling on here and carrying on and let, let you get into your presentation. Um, I think it's great that you've got some practical real world data and analysis to share with us um, as well, you know, and I think everyone says, oh, there's a great opportunity, but I think you're also going to share with us some of the challenges, which is important because it's not all sometimes sunshine and roses. So over to you, sir. Um, good morning. It's uh it's a real privilege to be with you this morning, and I've got quite a bit to uh, um, to get through. And on the on the agenda, it's a build up to the business end uh, of this case study. But I think it's important that I just line it up and show you a bit of background before I get into the real meat of the presentation. Um, Golden Arrow, just a bit of high level um, um, statistics. We're 160 years old. One April will be 161. We operate more than 1,100 buses in, in and around Cape Town, more than 2,500 employees. We travel about 65 million kilometers, and for that, we use more than 25 million liters of diesel. Um, looking at the previous graph, the bottom line, that 25 million liters of diesel. It's uh, not huge, but it's quite a chunky carbon footprint. So a way to address that, one of the ways to address that will be fuel consumption. And for us, uh, um, if, we put it, if we have to be frank, then uh, um, it starts with uh, a commercial solution. And then the carbon reduction or the carbon, carbon footprint reduction is a fantastic fringe benefit that comes with it. So what have we done? Uh, um, we've been on a fairly steady um, fleet renewal program for the last 20 plus years. And when you do that, you introduce later or latest technology vehicles. With that comes the, the consequent fuel improvement that, uh, um, that you expect. In the last, uh, until pre-COVID, we bought more than 1,200 buses. We've slowed that process down slightly. And on average, we buy just more than 60, 60 vehicles a year. So what has that done in the last 10 years? we've shown plus minus a 9% fuel improvement, fuel consumption improvement. So that gives you a related um, 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 carbon footprint reduction. Moving on to electricity, it's not a huge expense in, in our, um, our bigger scheme of things at Golden Arrow. But um, again, it started as a commercial, uh, how can we save, uh, um, save some money? So if you look at solar installations, it's a no-brainer. You reduce your dirty electricity that you use. Um, we've got solar PV installations at six of our depots around Cape Town. We started back in 2017 with our first two really small installations, and it was fantastic. It showed us where to do it and where not to do it yet in 2017. Every year, it's getting easier to actually justify the feasibility for solar installation. In mid-March, we'll, um, we'll have a generating capacity of about 1.4 megawatt peak. And one of the small things that we're busy with at the moment, that's the mid-March installation that needs to kick in. At our depot in Woodstock in Cape Town, above our fueling station, we've removed the, the asbestos roof, which is really uh, um, environment unfriendly, and we're actually building a solar roof. We will test the, um, the, um, how waterproof the solar roof will be, but it is a first and we'll probably move this along. 
What this has uh, enabled us is that where we now, and it was not started with this in mind, is that we've got quite good experience of how do you, how do you work with a supplier, measure um, solar and all that. And we're in a quite nice situation where we've got enough knowledge that we can liaise with large scale uh, or, or with, with installers for potential large scale installations in the future on a much better foot than what we would have been if we did not do these installations. On your screen now, you'll see a photograph of uh, um, one of our rooftop in, um, um, installations. This is at our head office in Epping in Cape Town. There's between 2,300 and 2,400 panels on the roof there, plus minus 820 kilowatt peak generating capacity. Next one, carport um, at our depot close to the airport. We replaced an old carport that wanted to fall on the roofs of some of the staff with, uh, with, a, car, uh, with a solar carport. That's on your photograph, the part on the left. And then for, because we had the space, we added the, the portion on the right-hand side. And this actually now triggers the, the, the comments that in the future, the picture in, in, in my mind, and there's less people laughing now, that all our depots, everything we own, will either have a solar, um, um, either have a rooftop installation or a carport, just a carport away and, push, and, uh, um, and replace that with a bus port, for lack of a better phrase. So we believe that we're going to have as close to a solar roof over all our, um, all our depots, and then we'll go outside to see where we can generate electricity if we go on the route that we uh, are doing this test for. When we started this uh, test, we said, um, just high level, what's the challenges for electric buses? Well, if we start with government, there's no limited support for a really expensive startup phase. We've been lucky in the test that we've um, received support from Yulia, as, as a partner in our test. So that's often the blow of the cost of the test. Actually, uh, there's higher taxes on, on electric vehicles with um, comparable uh, um, combustion engine vehicles. So, so the limited at the top can maybe be raised, but um, let's not go there. Um, there's no operational electric buses in South Africa. Well, there's two now after we've put these two or, or the two that we're testing into, into operation, but there's no local data, and there's no active uh, um, OEM in South Africa. So there's either no or limited support um, in South Africa for electric buses. Um, moving on with some more challenges, if we look at the cost and the availability of, of, uh, of electricity, the increases in the last few years have been above uh, uh, um, inflation, so that's been, uh, been uh, um, a drawback. And then load shedding, it's a really ugly phrase that everybody is quite familiar with in South Africa. You take the two bullets in this present, in, um, under that heading, and the people want to send me to a psychiatrist with a route that we want to take. They got an eye, or they really shake their heads and why in the world would you want to do it? But I think Sean Westbrook, I think was his name in one of the intervals, his comment about the influence of load shedding and all that on his trip from Durban to Cape Town, I think one should take that a lot more to heart than what, what most people do. Additional to that, there's some real opportunities in this challenge because if you go for, for solar, and please, in my presentation with solar, you should probably in the back of your mind add wind there because we've got no experience with wind. So usually I just put solar there. We will go towards solar most probably, uh, I mean to wind, most probably with a supplier in, in the future. But there's serious potential here because you can protect yourself or at least partially protect yourself from cost and the availability risk for 20 odd years uh, um, in the future. So huge opportunity in our view. Then, sure. The number of times that uh, I've been uh, in the dirty electricity argument, um, um, I just don't get involved anymore because in our view, um, we acknowledge, of course, it's a no-brainer. Coal-generated electricity is not green. Um, we don't even argue, uh, nobody argues that point, but 
we believe it's substantially more important that we look at why don't we focus on the, the utilization of solar and wind and off-peak uh, um, electricity um, that, that can actually give us a big solution to this or to where we want to go. And then maybe we should rather put the focus on the potential for us to save uh, foreign exchange, but not Im by importing less uh, oil. The graph on your screen now is our peak bus utilization. It's, a, it's actually a really sad picture because for an, unex an unbelievably expensive asset, the utilization is not good and it, it hurts. But so what this graph is showing us is over a 24 hour period, how many of our vehicles are operational? And you'll see the, what we refer to the morning and the afternoon peak, and then in the middle of the day, the off peak period. And I'll build a bit on this to show you how this fits in to some of the dreams or plans that we've got. Um, if we look at the morning peak, our morning peak starts at four o'clock in the morning and it ends at nine o'clock. That's that first blip on the previous graph. And that's really high utilization. You can actually replace that high utilization with 100%. In, in the midday, we've got what we refer to as off peak. So that's between nine o'clock in the morning and three o'clock in the afternoon. And there, 30% of our vehicles are operational. So flip side of the coin, 70% of our vehicles have got a six hour charging window opportunity that's there. Then afternoon peak starts at three o'clock, ends at 9.30, high utilization, replace that with 100% if you want. Then we go into the nighttime off peak and that's from 9.30 till four o'clock tomorrow morning when the morning peak starts again. Again, there's about a 5% utilization. So six and a half hour window for 95% of our vehicles to charge. So this really plays into some of the plans or the dreams that we've got for the future. Just to put that in a picture, is that if you look at the graph, then you can have a look off peak tariffs early in the morning, solar charging, you can add um, in the middle of the day, and then off peak charging at the um, early evening to late evening. You can probably add wind to all three, the yellow dots. But this is a really good fit with the way that uh, um, we believe that electricity can be available in South Africa, number one, and we will not uh, add additional um, um, pressure on the, on, on, on the grid in the peak hours when uh, the highest usage of electricity takes place. So when we, when we started this test, we said, what do we actually want to do? And uh, um, I think this is something that uh, um, a few people mentioned this morning, we wanted to, to use real figures and replace the estimated variables that's out there. You've got a saying at Golden Arrow that a spreadsheet is forgiving, and uh, it really is. There's some guys that tease, they say, just tell you don't know what the answer must be, and he'll build you the spreadsheet. So once you start replacing the, the, these variables with real figures, that luxury goes away, and it's what we were actually are, what we're after. We wanted to, to check the or test the charge times and the challenges. In our test, we could only do the first bit because two buses, there's no challenges in charging them. Those challenges will come in the future. Maintenance skills, oh, of course, it's a total different set of skills that's required. We, we've addressed some of that already and um, we keep on addressing that as we go on. Um, we want to develop a feasibility, should we introduce or should we not introduce electric vehicles in South Africa? And I'll get close to, uh, um, to pointing which way we are leaning, what that feasibility is going to say in the next, say, six months. And then if there's requirements, what's the framework for future tests? And I'll touch on that a bit later as well. And then, uh, again, a cliche that we use quite often, we want to get off the spreadsheet and onto the top. And we've been doing that since April last year, and it's really been a good journey. So what's the initial results that we have seen? We've been testing two 37-seater BYD buses since April 2021. The first 7,000 kilometers, we did what we referred to as non-passenger testing. So what did we do? We loaded the vehicles with sandbags to simulate the legal limit of uh, um, weight limit of the vehicles. 
And there's this perception that these buses cannot get up the hills in Cape Town. So we drove every single hill we could find. We made sure we put the PR lady in the bus and we put the CEO in the bus. So we made sure that the PR lady, the CEO and myself went over every hill in Cape Town that we needed to, fully laden. And yes, of course, it slows down, but there's no problem with any hill in Cape Town with these vehicles. The real test that we actually wanted to do, that was just a sideline, was do we tick all the boxes for our standards for safety? And we wanted to do the range testing. And within those 7,000 kilometers, we could tick those boxes more than comfortably. And the range testing, it's one of those where can we trust the dials? And we now do. Since then, we have been, we, we've done more than 50,000 kilometers in these buses since 28 June 2021, when we introduced the buses to our passengers. They love it. The, the drivers tell me that it's a comfortable ride. It is, um, it, it is less noisy. Plus, they say when they approach a bus stop and on their destination screen, they've got a similar destination as the, as the bus in front of them. The passengers run to the electric vehicle because they want to drive in an electric bus. It's a comfortable ride and it's really novel. Moving on, probably the most important slide of this presentation by Country Mile. Um, energy, energy um, is responsible for more than 50% of what we refer to as engineering costs. So uh, um, our tests have shown it is just south of one kilowatt hour per kilometer. I'm being teased. They say you use one because it's the only figure you can use in your head to multiply and divide with. So, uh, but that is the answer. So yes, we do use one when we do the bulk of our calculation. Um, so with energy cost, if you take the December cost of electricity and of, uh, of diesel, you're going to cut about 70% of your energy bill if you go il um, with electric buses. Then we've got some estimates because we haven't got the results yet. It's going to take quite a while to get there. But we had a look at where do we spend uh, uh, our money at the moment? Have, um, do we find the same part in an, an electric um, bus? So there's a little bit of science in there, but it is still an estimate. We believe spare parts, we, it's going to be down by about 50%. Um, by 50%. Oil and lubes, we've, we've put down 80%. We think it's conservative. We think it's going to be more. Tires, of course, no impact. Um, yeah, one must actually be a little bit careful because in the diesel buses, we've got uh, 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 a program that's controlled acceleration. So the guys cannot drive like uh, um, Max was stopping. We'll probably have to do something similar with the electric vehicle because acceleration is fantastic. Um, so there we need to, to, to still have a look. And then a really, really sensitive issue, labor. Um, it's probably minus 30%. And people look at that and often you hear bigger figures than that being bandied around. In a golden era environment where we insource our maintenance, we do everything ourselves, three, three areas of the maintenance. Uh, you look at your mechanical shop and your electrical shop. They're probably going to harm but the body shop's gonna stay the same. The way the maniacs drive, um, they're probably gonna increase your body shop, but we cannot penalize an electric bus for maniacs in Cape Town. But we see about minus 30% in labor and that's really sensitive. So what we have started is uh, we've started training what we refer to as two-star artisan. And this is for lack of, uh, of, of, of a creative name. An artisan, when they qualify, they get their certificate, there's a big red star on it. So we've taken a group of 20, split between diesel mechanics and auto electricians, and they've qualified, but we're now training them on, on the, other, um, the other trade. So at the end of this program, they will have two certificates with each with a red star on, so really creative, a two-star artisan, either a combination, okay, these guys will be between diesel mechanics and auto electricians, they'll be uh, um, qualified as both, and then we're going to do exactly the same thing in our body shops where we will qualify people both as a, as a body build, vehicle bodybuilder and a spray painter. So in the next few years, that's the route that we want to take to really qualify the people the way that we believe they should be qualified for where the vehicle um, trend is going. Plus, 
what are my people that might be not with us anymore? Really, uh, um, we want to create a big demand in the market for, for, uh, for the people. Then, okay, moving on from the results. Da Vinci said simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. So let's go the simple route or the simplicity route. Um, is it the simple solution to introduce electric vehicles or electric buses? So if you want to go there, we believe there's two hurdles that you need to, 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 uh, um, to still get past. First one, you need to build the buses in South Africa. To import them will just not work. The import taxes are going to kill you. So that's the biggest hurdle, and that's one that must be passed before you even take the next step. In private uh, electricity generation, plus the distribution of it, wheeling, that will be required to have a look or to have control over your reliability and your um, some cost control. I think people underestimate the difficulty of wheeling. I hear people saying all kinds of things, but that will come. In our case, if we go back to 60 buses a year, we can accommodate probably the first two years of electric vehicles without too much of the, the, the um, private generation with what we can do in-house with our own uh, um, solar installations, plus, plus, plus. So in, to, in year two, if you go this positive route, in year two, definitely year three, that will become a crucial part of the implementation. Um, then Don Norman said the opposite, simplicity is highly overrated. So if we want to go a complex route, then we say, so what can government do and what can local government do? And I'm repeating what many people have said before, um, yesterday and today. If you look at central government, uh, yeah, have a look at the tax, tax um, discrepancies between the two vehicles, incentives for EV purchases, and from our point of view, who's on the other side of the table who uh, um, will take an incentive, we emphasize, and I should put that short-term in bold, it should be a short-term incentive to leave the next line, to put the incentive on, yes, we need to manufacture these things in South Africa. It is really important, and I'm not going to repeat it that we might let, be left behind and all those things. You've heard that before. And then support alternate electricity generation. On a Chris Yellen uh, webinar last week, I heard um, um, a guy speak and he said, set electricity generation free. And I said, yes. I think government will get the shivers, but that's probably what needs to happen. The 100 megawatt is a really good start, but we should really open this thing up that we've got lots of electricity. I've made the wild call that I say if government gets out of the way, we'll probably have too much electricity within 15 or 20 years, but uh, let's not go there. Local governments, similar off-peak ele electricity tariffs, uh, support alternate electricity generation. It's similar as the previous one and what many people have said before. So what's the summary that I've got? Um, it's a really promising start. It's Really, um, that promising should also be in bold. Um, the dirty electricity argument, um, we really encourage people to change the focus slightly. Isn't dirty electricity better than importing dirty fuel as a step one of this transition? And then we move towards the, 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 um, the greening of the, of the energy. Um, if we get stuck in this one, we might be stuck in that chicken and egg challenge that people have referred to as well. Then what's our next steps at Golden Arrow? Well, we've ordered what we refer to as a 65-seater Golden Arrow specification bus, electric bus. Um, that will arrive in May. And the biggest focus when the bus arrive and when it's been through all the tests, at, all the legal tests, that it's legally on the road in Cape Town, will be for us to test the, 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 the energy consumption. Um, and our big question is, will the latest technology be as, in, for a 65-seater vehicle, be as energy efficient as an older technology 37-seater vehicle? If we can tick those, that box, then the next bullet kicks in. We need to go and find local bus bodybuilders that will build electric buses in South Africa. We want to do that in quarter three and four of 2022. 
And then just to cover myself, I put some two big red question marks on local ele electric bus manufacturing in South Africa. Um, I want to replace that. We desperately want to replace those two red question marks with 2023. That is the target that we've set ourselves. Then just before I finish, um, in 2017, 12 cities that were led by London, Paris, and Los Angeles signed the C40 Cities Agreement on green and healthy streets and clean bus declaration. I'm not sure if the current um, authorities in Cape Town, Durban, Johannesburg, and Chwane um, are all aware of this because they, they committed to not buying. They'll only buy zero emission buses um, from 2025. And uh, that's really, really close. I nearly used a very bad word there to say how close it is. But it is really close. So we really need to, uh, I think the city of Cape Town need to hope that Golden Arrow is successful with finding somebody that will build these buses in South Africa. Otherwise, um, we cannot hit that target. Thank you very much. Gideon, um, yeah, phenomenal. I mean, amazing presentation. Uh, my first comment is going to be, would it be right to say that the performance of these electric buses uh, exceeded your expectations? Uh, definitely. <laughs> Country mile. Country mile. Fantastic. And I mean, so, so, so based on what you just told us now, you got a 65 seat on order for May. Is, is Golden Arrow's intention to, to, to move forward, let me say the word, aggressively with an electrification move for your buses? No, for sure. It's, uh, as I said, if, if the energy consumption of the 65-seater mirrors the energy consumption of the one that you see on the picture, then, uh, um, then all the dominoes are falling in the right direction. The next step is to start uh, or to find somebody to build it in South Africa and then to procure back to our 60 buses per year. If they were all going to be electric, we still need to make that, that uh, final decision. But in 2023, we need to buy 60 new vehicles. Um, so we need to decide all 60 electric or a big portion of that. I would go for a big portion, if not all of that electric. And then from early, we're already in discussions with suppliers that can uh, build solar farms and all these kind of things. Then we'll really put that one in, uh, um, in turbo mode to start chasing the supply of, uh, of electricity. But we've got a little bit of time there on our side. So we focus on where the, we try not to, try and do everything and then end up doing nothing. So step one is we need to get the buses building, built in South Africa. Fantastic. I'm going to hand over to Yaku because I know he was quite fascinated with some of your solar stuff that you were putting forward. Yeah, Gideon, man, first of all, absolutely inspired. Um, you're talking of the guys that's, that's standing at the bus stop that would have run to the electric bus. Oh, that's me. That's definitely one of, <laughs> of I would have been one of those guys. So, uh, Gideon, first, first question, just in terms of if, if you to do the numbers on your entire fleet of 1,200 buses. First of all, that's a massive fleet, by the way. But how, how big a solar farm or how big a power generation facility would you need to build just to power that, hypothetically, of course. Um, we, we've actually done that. Again, I, I, I've used the phrase, we've got a few uh, really stupid quotable quotes of Golden Arrow. The, um, <laughs> one of them, we say that if the, if the sums don't work on a big button calculator, run for the hill. So big button calculator sums, it is, uh, it, it is less than 100 megawatt. We think it's about 80. Yeah. And uh, um, 80, 80 will give us enough electricity to cover our, uh, our requirement in June and July. So in December, you're not going to know what to do with all the electricity, but that's a nice problem to have. So we think it's somewhere between 80 and 100 less because the efficiencies of the, of the solar panels get better. We, we produce them, they're not that good. So. Worst case scenario, 100, but we think it's less. 
Well, just just on that, and really a big thing for us in, in the solar industry, especially, is is really the cooperation with the grid, and not not grid defection, but actually working with the grid, working with the utilities, and building plants to work there. So that what you're talking of overproduction in in December. Um, clearly, a bulk of your fleet is down in Cape Town, based on that. Um, and and <laughs> so, so, you know, you you really have that opportunity to to also work with the grid. Uh, naturally, there's things like storage which you've considered. And I really enjoyed your your profile, looking at you know the the morning peaks and, and afternoon peaks. Um, really, that that's the the next opportunity that comes in that space. If you're looking at energy arbitrage. Your buses are actually really big storage units on wheels, which is really an opportunity to do that arbitrage. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think uh, really, as I say, inspiring. There's so many opportunities with that what you've mentioned, um, and actually assisting the grid. Contrary to to popular belief, this is actually an opportunity to help the grid to stabilize the grid um, in the form of that massive amount of storage that you're going to be procuring if you are buying 1,200 buses eventually. Sure. Yeah, and I think, uh, Gideon, just to see, I mean, just to add on to that, just to see your, your guys' approach and, and doing, as you say, real-world studies, um, just, just amazing. And it, yeah, it, it, I think a lot of people are blown away by some of, the, some of the numbers that you've shared with us. Yeah, just in terms of the numbers out of interest, uh, Gideon, um, so you, you showed us the back breakdown of, of energy saving, maintenance saving. Um, Average number, if, if you were to take it across that, if, if you've got a rough number, and I mean, that, that's an easier number for us to remember to say, this, this is a study, a real world study that Golden Arrow actually did. Um, overall on maintenance, they saved X amount. Uh, do you have a number? And, and we, we're not keeping you to that. We know it's yeah. still a study in, in, in progress, but uh, do you have a number? I, I, I think it's a little bit uh, premature to go there, but... Uh, um, for us, the, just the fuel side, excluding the rest, it's already pointing to that uh, um, it's, it, it's going to be, um, it's, it's most probably a feasible solution. On our side of the table at the moment, we're actually quite nervous because we say, what are we missing? Because why are more people not as excited as us? So uh, um, I keep on telling the guys you need to shoot holes in the arguments because I get really, um, we do get nervous because usually you go for a project that's uh, just, just, just there, just there about. This one looks not a no-brainer, but what, if we can build them in South Africa, we've got an idea what the capital cost needs to be compared to a diesel one. Then uh, um, we are worried <laughs> that it looks too good to be true, and you know what the saying, what the next part of that saying is. But it is really positive. There's nothing so far. I think that's the summary. There's not a single thing so far that tells us not to carry on. Well, Gideon, I think that I guess purpose of days like today. Um, personally, I've driven, and our family has driven in excess of about two hundred and fifty thousand kilometres with electric vehicle. And those numbers are accurate. Uh, I mean, I've, I've also tried to shoot holes in them, and I haven't been able to do that in 250,000 kilometers. So, sure. Kideon, soldier on ahead. You guys are on the right route. Fantastic. Welcome and visit. We love it. <laughs> we, we're, uh, it's, it's substantially more bling than the normal Golden Arrow bus, and we're really <laughs> proud of this. Please come and visit. We, uh, we, uh, we do like to show people that we can get the excitement going because we won't get somebody in South Africa to build the vehicle it's for Golden Arrow. We, <laughs> we need a lot of people interested in this to actually get the industry going. Thank you, Gideon. Well, Gideon, I mean, I think that's great. A lot of people always ask about local manufacturing. I think everyone gets stuck on the cars and stuff. You've just put the challenge on the table. Mm. Golden Arrow needs 60 electric buses manufactured locally. So. You know, there's, there, there, there's our newsreel, there's our news clip. You know, somebody needs to step up and uh, come to the party for you guys. Sounds good. Fantastic. Awesome. Good on, we're going to let you go, sir. I'm sure you've got to go and crunch those big, big button calculators. Give some more. And uh, we're going to break for a lunch break. So thank you very much for your time, sir. And, uh, yeah, I look forward to seeing more results and more electric golden arrows on the, on the road. It's really, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me.